lots of journalists as well. Oh, really? Oh, okay. All right. We're at the side mic stage. This is the last interview of the whole session. Give yourselves a round of applause for coming to the last session. I'm just proud. I'm just happy. I'm also, this is the 15th one, 15th interview we've done. And we're going to be talking about Alzheimer's and uh, research. And we have here a PhD doctor and medical doctor, Matif. I'm going to do this. Ambassetti. Wonderful. Yes. <laughs> Last one. Did it. Welcome to the SciMic stage. Thanks a lot, Gina. And um, I want to talk about kind of, can you break down where we are right now with like Alzheimer's, maybe research? Let's do that. Like, can you kind of give us the lay of the land of what's happening right now? So thanks a lot for having me. Yeah, um, so I think uh, this is a very exciting time for researchers in Alzheimer's disease because this is the first time in decades that scientists have been able to target or change the key pathological features of the disease. So we've, we've known now for several years, for more than 100 years actually, that the brains of patients with Alzheimer's disease have buildup of abnormal proteins in them. Okay, build up of that for a hundred years. Yes. So Dr. Alois Alzheimer, who described the disease that now bears his name, described the plaques and tangles in the brain of a patient who had Alzheimer's disease. So this was post? That's correct. Okay. And he described that in 1906. So we've known that brains of patients with Alzheimer's disease have these abnormal collections of proteins that form plaques and tangles. And we've been able to study these you know, for decades. But this is for the very first time that we now have drugs that we can use to try and clear these proteins from the brain. So from a scientific perspective, I really think... Them out? Yes. Wow. Oh, okay, continue. So from a scientific perspective, I really think this is a landmark. It's a clear milestone. So we've not only been able to study these proteins, but we have now have the methods, the drugs, the tools to try and clear the brains of Alzheimer's patients of these presumably toxic proteins. So that, I think, is, is, is historic. It's a scientific landmark. Uh, and so there's a lot of excitement in the field uh, of Alzheimer's research. Um, whether or not that translates into effective treatments is, however, a question that remains to be answered. So you're talking about research, and are there clinical trials, or wh where are we... S where are we seeing this drug or this combination of treatments actually clearing out the plaque? What kind of studies are doing that? So the slide that I have uh, behind you is uh, the seminal publication in the New England Journal of Medicine. And that came out in January of last year. And it reports uh, the results from a large phase three clinical study of a drug called lecanemab. This is an antibody that binds to one of these abnormal proteins called beta amyloid in the brain clears the brain of beta amyloid in patients who get the drug. And these then, are human patients? Yes, these are wow. patients with Alzheimer's disease. This is, okay. And this was a trial that recruited nearly 1,800 patients wow. in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease, randomized them to either the drug or placebo over 18 months, and then showed for the very first time that patients who got the drug actually seemed to decline slowly compared to patients who got the placebo. Wow. And so this is a landmark uh, study, and it led to uh, the FDA giving the drug full approval for treating patients in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease. Wow. Uh, so, you know, we're just a year out from the approval. So, again, a clear example of how research could potentially translate into effective treatments. And that's why I, I put the slide up. And, and let's take, a, like, a step back and actually, like, describe what Alzheimer's disease looks like what, what somebody's going through when they have that disease? So Alzheimer's disease is a type of dementia. Uh, and dementia is the term that's used to describe a variety of illnesses that cause problems with a person's thinking and memory. And Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia. It typically affects a person's ability to recall new information, recent information. And as it progresses, it can affect various other aspects of a person's thinking and cognition. Their ability to solve problems, their ability to multitask, uh, their ability to uh, find words, recognize people. And as the disease progresses, it causes dramatic changes in a person's ability to care for themselves. 
uh, in their level of independence and they get increasingly dependent on caregivers for their day-to-day -day, um, uh, activities of uh, living. And so this is a relentlessly progressive disease. Uh, it places a huge toll, uh, both physical and emotional, not only on the patient, uh, but also on their loved ones. Uh, and it's a disease that we've not been able to do much about in terms of effective treatments for patients for decades. Right, so you're saying like when it was, you think the first inklings of it in research and papers in 1906 and then to now, really it's just been the last like, would you say decade or like five years in which we've had these massive advances? So the last uh, symptomatic treatment for Alzheimer's disease was approved by the FDA in 2003. Okay. When I was still um, doing my clinical training. And these uh, are symptomatic treatments, which means that they don't really alter the course of the disease. The disease continues to progress but they might slow the disease symptoms a little bit. Uh, but we are now presumably on the threshold of drugs that we hope, and I use the word hope, that we hope might actually change the course of the disease itself because they're able to alter a fundamental biological aspect of the disease by removing some of these toxic proteins from the brain. That's the hope. And so uh, let's get back to that because when you say clear out the proteins, you... I mean, I'm imagining a buildup and then actually reversing that buildup, taking it away. Is that what you're saying? That's exactly, that's exactly correct. So, for example, okay. in the trial that uh, we, we were just talking about, when you do PET scans, so these are specialized uh, scans of the brain that can measure this uh, amyloid protein, patients who get the drug virtually drop their levels down to zero almost. Wow. So these drugs seem to do a fantastic job of doing what they were supposed to do, to clear the brain of these presumably toxic proteins. Um, and so I think that in itself is a scientific achievement, like I said. Uh, but these drugs also come with uh, a risk of side effects. Okay. And, and harms. Uh, what and are so, those? Uh, a risk of brain swelling. Okay. A risk of brain bleeding. Um, a loss of brain volume, so shrinkage of the brain. Oh, wow. And so as a practicing physician... Uh, I need to balance those risks versus benefits when I talk to my patients about these drugs. So what we want to do is to be able to make sure that the patients have all the information that they need and empower them and their families to make the right decision about whether this drug is right for them or not. Present the relatively small benefits in terms of disease slowing versus real risks of brain swelling, brain bleeding, and brain uh, shrinkage. Um, and so I think that's where we are at now. We've made a tremendous scientific advance but it remains to be seen if that really translates into safe, effective, um, meaningful, and accessible treatments for everybody. I like when you said you're at the threshold. So what is your hope then um, for the future? Do you hope to have maybe um, another drug that doesn't have these side effects? Or are you hoping to do a clinical trial on people who are further along in Alzheimer's and see if that can be reversed? I think there are lots of avenues to explore in terms of research. I think as a field, we recognize that these are a advance in uh, treating Alzheimer's disease, but there are likely to be many more approaches that we need to explore, uh, not just clearing amyloid, not just clearing one or two of the toxic proteins in the brain, but perhaps to deal with inflammation in the brain, perhaps to deal with uh, other processes in the brain like cell death, so we are now at the point where we recognize that we might need multiple approaches to truly make an impact uh, in altering the disease course. And that brings us to the theme. Last, last interview, last theme question, like towards science without walls. In your research, do you, where do you see interdisciplinary, other breaking down barriers happening in that kind of study? So I can give you an example from my own work. Uh, so I have uh, a relatively small group at the National Institute on Aging but we've built a collaborations that span disciplines. Uh, most of the work that we do has people from uh, epidemiology, uh, people from the basic sciences, uh, people who work with transgenic mouse models, people who work with large electronic uh, healthcare records. Uh, oh, healthcare and, records, of course. Yes. Uh, and so I think my own work, my own group is an example of the power of interdisciplinary science. And I really think that's the way to go. Do you think that that is why things have advanced in the last decade, is interdisciplinary work? Absolutely. So the fact that we are now able to do these clinical trials is a great example of how 
interdisciplinary science would work because these trials would not have been possible if physicists and you know, you're a physicist thank, yourself. Thank you. It was me. If physicists hadn't uh, developed uh, novel methods to image these proteins in the brain. Yeah. So we now need uh, PET scans to make sure that somebody's brain does have amyloid deposits before they can be enrolled in the clinical trials. Mm -hmm. So we need physicists, we need chemists making these compounds to label these proteins. Uh, we need researchers, we need neurologists, uh, we need psychologists to try and measure changes in memory and functioning. What so the I symptoms think, are. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So I think all of these are clear examples of how interdisciplinary science can come together and eventually how the product is much more than just the sum of its individual parts. As, as a medical doctor, this is my last question, as a medical doctor, I see this like hope in your eyes, right? Like, do you, do you feel that? Do you feel like you can talk to patients, you can talk to people in these clinical trials and you like, this is the first time in decades where you can like give them some amount of hope? I definitely think so. I think okay. uh, it's, it's uh, clearly a time of hope. Uh, it's also a hope that's tempered with a little bit of caution but it reinforces the importance of uh, having patients participate in clinical trials, be enthusiastic in the promise of research. And a lot of my patients sign up to participate in clinical trials knowing fully well that they might not themselves directly benefit from the studies, but what they learn from the trials might help a generation down the line. So I think it's really critically important to get patients enthusiastic about participating in these research studies. Thank you. You've actually given me hope about this. I've learned so much. Thank you, double doctor, Thumbs Dumbasetti. My pleasure, Gina. Thanks Thank a you. Lot. Thank you. <laughs> I think I hit that.